My name is Claire Gomes, and today I will be facilitating the first in a two-part webinar series on marine emergency response hosted by AMSOL. Um, we would like to thank Maritime Review Africa and Colleen Jacker for making this webinar jam platform available to us for the session. For those who are new to AMSOL, we'd like to introduce our company to you. We are a leading maritime employer. Um, employing more than 400 South African seafarers on 19 vessels across the region. We currently have 12 owned vessels on the South African ships register and under the South African flag. And over the last two years, we have expanded a fleet renewal program and invested in a number of new assets, uh, indicating our confidence in the future of the maritime sector. 33% of our company is owned by employees. And of our 550 employees, 42% are under the age of 35. And I think that is a great indication of maritime leaders of the future coming through the talent pipeline. We focus our support on maritime education, um, supporting learners of maritime subjects in grades 10 to 12 with a number of initiatives, including a education resource and textbooks. And we have a diverse supply chain that supports many SMMEs in our specialist industry. We drive transformation in the sector um, with operations across the region. We are a South African business active in Africa and our footprint on the continent is expanding. We work with both government and private sector clients and have operations, resources and vessels along the Southern African and West African coast. We work in four distinct sectors, energy, ports, mining, and maritime, and offer a portfolio of marine solutions um, from ocean and coastal towage to emergency response, which we're talking about today, marine consultancy services, marine and cargo surveying, vessel management, maintenance, and manning. In the port sector, we specialize in harbor towage, and subsea and diving projects, also able to offer emergency response. To the mining sector, with unique challenges of cargo transshipment, we manage specialist operations inshore, in port or offshore. And we also provide 24 seven, 365 offshore supply and support to mining industry clients. Energy sector, we offer an expanded series of services, including ship to ship fuel transfers in port and offshore, offshore support for exploration activities, air saturation and ROV subsea operations, and we manage offshore oil and gas terminals uh, in the region. Our portfolio of clients is diverse across all four sectors. And today we're pleased to be bringing you a comprehensive program, which is the first in our two part series. We'll be touching on a general introduction to marine response and salvage first, followed by um, a, a presentation that outlines all parties involved in a marine emergency. And we'll close off today's session with an outline of some of the cases we've certainly been involved in providing support for over the last year and a half before dealing with questions that you may have for us during the course of the session. On that note, if I could invite Strategic Sourcing Executive from AMSOL, Pumla Makubala, to switch on her camera. Thank you, Claire. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. My name is Pumla Makubalo. And as a member of the AMSOL leadership team, I would like to extend a warm welcome of the following stakeholders represented here today. Fellow industry players, public sector partners, insurers, members of the legal fraternity, academia, members of the fourth estate, and my fellow AMSOLites. All protocol observed. As a member of the International Salvage Union, key issues around salvage are of importance to us at AMSO. The 2021 Marine Emergency Response, 
webinar program taking place today and next Tuesday has been specifically put together to ensure that your time and attention will be rewarded with access to new information that can assist you and your companies into the future. We hope that the case study material and insights prepared um, for this session will add to your knowledge base. We have organized this webinar not only to share specialist knowledge and bring together stakeholders, but also to supplement other important and proactive initiatives across the industry and also to ensure preparedness in case of a marine emergency occurring along our coastline. It has been nearly five years since AMSO was launched in 2016, and it has certainly been a challenging and dynamic period for us. The last 18 months have, have also been difficult for us in the industry, especially for our seafarers and our economy. During this period, utilization of the emergency response towage tag, which is the SA Amandla, was significantly higher than in previous years. This is indicating that the risk of marine emergency on our coastline has not diminished. We look forward to sharing case studies from this period during this webinar. I thank you. Thank you, Claire. I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce my colleague, Dave Murray. Dave has a career in the maritime industry spanning some 40 years, and he joined SAF Marine in 1980 as a navigating cadet. He spent 10 years as a navigating officer, of which three were on salvage tugs, and he came ashore in 1991 and joined Pinto Marine. Subsequently, he has served in various commercial roles in Pinto Marine, Smith Pinto Marine, Smith Amanda Marine, and now Amsol, with a specific focus on offshore marine services. The services provided by this business unit include towage, offshore supply and support, vessel management, salvage and emergency response. He is, coincidentally, usually the Amsolite who picks up the phone at six minutes past two on a Sunday morning if your vessel is in trouble at sea and needs assistance. And uh, I think he is today off the back of a few sleepless nights so, Dave, thank you very much for, for being with us and sharing your knowledge. All right. Thanks very much, Claire. Much appreciated. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thanks for the introduction, Claire. So, onto the presentation. This is really just an introduction to salvage marine emergency response. It's extremely high level. Uh, we don't drill down too much, and I suppose a lot of this will be well known to many of, of you. Um, but it's an interesting presentation, it's a nice one to give, lots of interesting pictures, and just gives a high-level overview, as I said. Um, and also, um, emergency response operations are generally <clears throat> quite technical, quite complicated, and a number of you will be either providing legal input, uh, will be agencies who are dealing directly with the ship owners, ship repairers, etc., etc., and it just shows as well what we as emergency responders may need from, from you guys to, to give us the support uh, when we do um, proceed with operations on the coast. So the index will cover what is salvage, emergency response, wreck removal, environmental care, and the secret to successful salvage. So what is salvage? Um, it dates back to the start of the maritime trade, uh, which just goes to show that right at the start of the maritime trade, these unscrupulous solvers have always been around, preying on the poor, unsuspecting ship owners. Um, but yeah, this is really not the case. I think, as everyone's aware, uh, solvers add a huge amount to the maritime industry in general, basically assisting in uh, preservation of the environment, preservation of property, uh, preservation of life, which is more important. And having solvers on standby, I think, is really to the benefit of the maritime community. And looking at what we've set up or what we have set up in South Africa with the support of various partners, having an ETV on standby, having a full spread of salvage gear, salvage masters, etc., I think is quite important. So let's kick the, uh, <clears throat> the thought of these unscrupulous 
commercially driven solos into touch. I think we provide a, an important service to the maritime industry and, and many, many people rely on us. My colleague uh, Pire, who is our legal counsel, will go into this in more depth next week. I'm not a legal person at all, so I'll leave the qualified to, to talk. But this just goes to show that this goes back many years. And to, in, uh, to encourage the response, um, the fourth bullet point this is when you help to solve this you're entitled to a reward so this is to re encourage a maritime response uh, again probably it sounds like sort of commercially driven however i think every company is in this world to to make a profit um, and this is how solvers make their profits at the end of the day and as said there the principle is to encourage maritime assistance Again, won't go into this in much depth. I'll leave this to uh, to, to period to pick up. But pretty much um, origins of salvage law, Roman law, uh, which went on to to UNCLOS, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, uh, which was signed up in in London in 1989. Uh, South Africa is part of that signatory, and is ratified by 55 nations. <clears throat> Um, under UNCLOS, the obligations of the coastal state are a right of innocent passage, safe traffic routes, navigation guidance, search and rescue services, piloted services. And it also gives the state certain obligations in order to protect and preserve the maritime environment, either individually or jointly, using all the activities under their jurisdiction and with measures to minimize damage to the fullest extent. I think there's two quite important points here, which are drivers on the South African coast. Uh, the rights of innocent passage, and we'll cover this a bit later, but you know, we're sitting on the sort of confluence of the east and the west traffic lanes, and there's a great deal of, of what we refer to as scrap tonnage, basically coming from the, um, from the west to the east, uh, destined for the subcontinent. Uh, I think as most people are aware, these vessels are generally not well maintained, um, if they're on their own uh, propulsion, if they're under tow, the tugs are generally substandard, frequently there's no insurance, um, but there's a right of innocent passage and these vessels do come around and, and often will either break down or will um, pop the tow. And the weird thing that I'm still trying to work out is, I don't know why they seem to choose sort of July, August, September to do this, uh, surely they can, sort of choose the, the weather uh, season a little bit better. But this is a challenge. Uh, it is right of innocent passage, and these do have the ability to cause damage to the environment, damage to the coastline, and at the end of the day, if they're not effectively insured, uh, leave the, the state with, with quite, a, quite a big bull. With regard to the obligation to protect and preserve, uh, where we say individually or jointly, I think here South Africa as well drives this very effectively. I think of the Benguela Current Commission, where we sit with Angola and Namibia, where I'm aware these, uh, these issues are discussed. And I'm sure South Africa, almost seen as a leader of, of SADC and sitting at a highly sensitive sea passage, I also have input with regard to um, the countries on, on the East Coast, such as Mozambique, Madagascar, Mauritius, etc. So the official version of salvage, um, it's a voluntary response. I think that, you know, the three takeaways on this is voluntary. Um, there needs to be third party involvement, other than which the ship's crew would have been able to prevent, uh, enable a, a, a solution. And then from which the ship or property could not have been saved without the effort of the salvor or a third party. So this is how IMO defines salvage and it really wraps up uh, basically what, what the drivers are. So what are the possible causes of, uh, of salvage operations? Again, this is very high level, but uh, we'll sort of drill down very briefly. So collisions, groundings, fire and explosions, capsizing and listing, sinkings, mechanical failure, and structural failure. And the causation of these are often human error, incompetence or negligence, navigational obstruction, stability change, such as in cargo or ballast, structural or mechanical failure, or war or civil disturbance. Um, 
maybe I shouldn't be admitting it too openly, but but I have been around a while. Um, in fact, I started with the then Penta Marine in the early 90s. And I think, uh, as Brian Ingpen calls us, the, the Korsbrucker in those days, if sort of the audience can remember, there were a lot of issues in those days with regard to structural failure. Uh, we had a number of, of bulk carriers with structural failure, a number of tankers, uh, which necessitated ship-to-ship -ship transfers. This is not so prevalent anymore. And I think there are changes to technology, um, shipbuilding, higher vigilance by class societies on behalf of insurers has, has changed this a lot. Um, what has also improved a lot is when you talk about human error. Human error is always going to happen. It's natural. But what has assisted this is, is sort of increased um, training methods, more focused uh, technological inputs with regard training training methods. Um, so this has also improved. However, I think everyone's aware right now, there's, especially with, with the COVID-19 world upon us, uh, there's a huge driver for, um, <clears throat> for cost cutting. So the concern is that maybe these are going to become more prevalent again with regard, um, you know, cost cutting for cheaper seafarers, maybe not as effectively trained, uh, maybe looking at the ways around uh, classification surveys etc so this yeah this could possibly um sort of increase over the next couple of years but we'll keep a good eye on that so there's three types of salvage operation uh, we break them down into wet salvage and dry salvage so under dry salvage is basically emergency response Environmental protection could be both wet or dry, um, and then wet salvage is basically wreck removal. So we've spoken about this, just to break it down, uh, types of salvage operation. Dry salvage is normally your, your drifters, groundings, which are able to be refloated, explosions, firefighting, uh, collisions, structural failure, etc. So it's normally where you achieve a solution by connecting up to the, uh, to the casualty and being able to deliver it to a safe port. It's also generally time constrained because there's a lot of urgency in avoiding that the vessel should become a, an environmental concern or a safety of life concern or a property concern. To go wet salvage, uh, generally these are wreck removals, can be done in shallow water, deep water. I think uh, if you look at some of the deep water salvage operations which have taken place. Um, it's quite unbelievable what technology enables us to do now. This is generally what is referred to as, as not time restricted. However, it depends. If you look at the fourth bullet point where we talk about port terminal clearance operations, uh, if a wreck is obviously obstructing a port, uh, it then becomes pretty much time crucial. If it's in a benign area or out of the way, it becomes less time crucial where the um, p &I club could then go out to tender for a wreck removal. But we'll cover this a little bit more uh, as we get along. Environmental care, uh, oil recovery operations, also shallow water, deep water and, uh, and pollution prevention. Again, uh, this has become more and more technically advanced uh, over, over time and deep water oil recovery is is really sort of become way ahead of of you know what it used to be um where we can go down to huge depths to uh, to recover oil and this again at the end of the day <clears throat> prevents pollution i think uh, just tying the last two operations into place being environmental care and wreck removal uh we had a an instance on the South African coast in 2000 called the Treasure. I think most will remember it. I think most people tie it back to the uh, the penguin escapade. But uh, there were two of, of these um, <clears throat> objectives tied into one. The one was oil removal. Luckily, it wasn't too deep, uh, 50 meters of water. And with our colleagues at, at SMIT and uh, SMIT Marine South Africa, we worked very closely to we cover the oil that we could through hot tap methods. We'll talk about that later. But there, there was a wreck reduction operation as opposed to a full wreck removal. It would have been very difficult to remove a Cape South bulk carrier full of iron ore from where she was. 
some sort were quite pragmatic and, and understood this and they were just concerned about the safety of navigation. So there we did what is called a wreck reduction as opposed to full wreck removal. And with chain cutting devices, we cut the accommodation and repositioned it. So it gave SAMHSA the required clearance over the top of the wreck to enable uh, safe navigation. We'll go into emergency response now. Marine casualties, again, a very high level, but just to say the first priority is first and foremost, safety of life. And here, as the, the government's ETD provider, we work very closely with MRCC. Um, often, if the casualty is way offshore out of helicopter range, uh, we would be the, the sort of first, uh, first asset on site. Um, and that's where we work very closely with MRCC. Obviously, if it's within helicopter range, etc., hopefully by the time we get there, this has been stabilized and we can be left to do what, what we're meant to be doing. So this covers casualties, groundings, fires and explosions, capsizing, listings, sinkings, mechanical failure, and structural failure. Human error factor, we spoke about that very briefly earlier on, incompetence or negligence, navigational obstructions, stability change, Structural mechanical failure, war or civil disturbance. Looking at collisions, uh, that's an interesting one. Vessels involved in a collision are locked together. Uh, generally, the first thought would be to try and separate them, but this is not really the case. It should happen. In fact, they should be kept in position, number one, to avoid pollution, but number two, to give the solvers uh, the ability to plan how the separation will be happening and how the separation will happen under control conditions. If you see that slide, you'll see lines going from the one vessel to the other, just holding them in place whilst the uh, salvage plan is, is formulated. In fact, this is just a bigger depiction of the last one. It's the gas Roman and the Springbok. This happened in Singapore in 2004. I think uh, the Springbok is quite an apt name. Uh, hopefully this doesn't happen to us when we come up against the Aussies and the New Zealanders in the next couple of weeks. But I think a good end to the story shows the resilience. The Springbok was extricated, repaired, and uh, continued trading. So maybe that's a good sign. This is a collision. Again, it, it shows that collisions can happen at any time or place in any form of weather condition. This happened in absolutely clear conditions. Um, there should have been no reason for this to have happened. As you can see, uh, the Vessel, which is parked on the other one, probably hit it at about 14, 15 knots. Uh, so there was no evasive action. There was no reduction in speed. The visibility was perfect. So it just goes to show that even under ideal conditions, these, these incidents do seem to happen. Grounding, I think most of you will remember this picture, the dreaded Phoenix, which ended up uh, north of the ground north of Durban um, a little while ago. This is one of the scrappers which came around the coast, uh, hit the beach, no insurance, and obviously gave the state quite a big headache because if the refloating hadn't happened, uh, they probably would have been faced with a massive wreck reduction operation or wreck removal operation that was on a very pristine and well-recognized beach. So this is one of the challenges of, of the scrap vessels coming around the coast. Um, and as I say, in the ground in the first 24 hours is crucial. So in that time, you need to try and get her off. If not, uh, it could be then more, more of a difficult refloat operation. Hard information is critical. Uh, in these situations, generally you will get hard information. We'll cover later that often when the casualty is way offshore, it's very really difficult to put information together because it's quite sketchy. You generally find the guys offshore are a little bit panicky. But this is a lot better to get um, informed information and getting a salvage team on board as soon as possible, generally with helicopters as we did in this occasion. This is another grounding. This is the Suda de Cadiz. Uh, this was a vessel which is was dedicated to carrying Airbus parts. I'm sure Airbus weren't too happy to see this, this picture, but it just shows how tidal range can affect uh, groundings. We don't have such a big tidal range in South Africa, but I think everyone's aware in the UK, um, they have tidal ranges quite extensive, and you can see here this vessel is high and dry. So refloating operations are very much uh, dependent on 
on tidal range and when the right time to, to refloat the vessel is. This is the Econ Tunda. We're just reflecting on a number of salvage cases which have happened. Um, we did have a spate of groundings, as I said, in the 90s and 2000s. This is the Econ Tunda of Scarborough, 2001. I think most of you will, will recall it uh, quite, quite clearly. The shots on the right-hand side just show generally, you know, it was highly um, high-level energy conditions and Basically, when the solvers are joining, uh, the, the, the ship's crew are evacuating. So that's why safety is, is a massive driver um, on, on our side. All the boxes need to be ticked. Risks need to be taken, which is obviously in salvage operations, but those risks need to be mitigated. The picture on the right, um, that was one of our salvage team being lowered down. Uh, he was a engineering superintendent who was with us at the time who came ashore for a nice quiet job in the office as an engineering superintendent and then found himself on the end of a line from a helicopter being lowered down in those conditions so sometimes it's not it's pretty hazardous for your life to be working in a salvage company because you get hauled in as most people do to uh, to these operations the Zen Hua 10, this happened in Rotterdam in 2008. Here we can just see the one tug. In fact, I think this operation, there were about 12 tugs involved. And, you know, the salvage master obviously has to be on his toes with regard to the coordination of, of 12 tugs. This was in the port area, so harbor tugs were used to refloat it. Another one, I think that uh, a lot of people would remember in 2003 coming to work on a Terrible winter's morning on the coast road from <clears throat> Table View through to town, seeing what looked like a ship in the middle of the road and uh, massive traffic jams were, were caused. The Sealand Express went aground in, in quite a big storm. A very complex operation, uh, many, many intricacies, which would take us too much time to go through. But this just goes to show the resources that often a salvo has to pull in to support it. We charted in two swire tanks, which happened to be around which assisted in the refloating. But over and above that, we had to charter in a very expensive dredger, which dredged a channel into the Sealand Express through which we could refloat it. So there again, you know, it shows that, that salvage operations can be tremendously expensive, can provide a big drain on the, uh, the pockets of a company. Um, so there, this also just goes to show that when a salvor is, is utilized, it needs to be a proper well-established solver as opposed to what we term yellow paid solvers who will pull in other services as and when required. This shows a lightning operation um, in place. As I said earlier on, a lot of structural failures happened in South Africa in the 90s, a number of tankers, Mimosa being one of them, which <clears throat> could have been a major, major disaster in the Port Elizabeth area without the intervention of the ETV. She was actually heading directly to Port Elizabeth, 300,000 tons of oil on board uh, when, the, uh, when the tug, this was in the same storm that the Oceano sunk and uh, 23 meter swells were me measured at, at, on the legs of the FA platform. So it was a really, really big one. Uh, without the intervention of the ETV, as I said, this could have been a major disaster, but we managed to get her offshore and did a ship-to-ship -ship transfer operation, lightening her completely so that the cargo she had on board could continue to, to port a destination. And she was then towed to Dubai for repairs. Fires and explosions um, gain effective early use of local resources. Fast response incre increases the chance of a successful outcome. Fifi boundary cooling. Crucial at all was a Fifi experienced, specialized equipment, trained personnel fire expert surveyors, which is uh, quite a, a scarce skill and, and often we have to bring in from overseas, but this often happens in the investigation as to why the fire happened. Uh, marine chemists, speed of response is critical. Um, chance of success is based on the speed of response and ensuring stability. So fire in a ship is not like a fire in an apartment block or in a, in a skyscraper where you can pour uh, huge quantities of water upon it and there's a, an exit at the bottom where the water will come out. 
with vessels, uh, you pour huge amounts of water into it, there's no way for water to come out and will affect the stability of, of the vessel. So the stability calculations need to be quite clear and, and quite well calculated to avoid any form of capsizing whilst the firefighting operation is happening. This is the Solvella in Saudi, Saudi Arabia, 2012. This was quite a massive explosion. The Flaminia, um, North Atlantic, 2012. This was an interesting case, also a, a big explosion fire. Um, this brought in, I think we'll cover it a bit later as well, ports and places of refuge. This vessel, this happened on the um, Western approaches to the English Channel. <clears throat> and none of the European nations were prepared to accept her. So I think she spent about two to three weeks offshore uh, before Germany offered her a um, port of refuge. But ports of refuge, I think, are becoming or have become a burning issue in salvage operations uh, to avoid basically a vessel which is damaged, the best place is, is alongside or in a safe area, not offshore waiting for decisions to be made. And this has become a, um, a big issue because many countries say not in my backyard and leaves the solver with quite difficult decisions to make. And at times, as we'll cover a bit later, has led to quite major uh, catastrophes which could have been avoided. This is one closer to home. We work very closely with our colleagues uh, in Smith on this one, where we provided the tug, they provided the personnel and equipment. This happened, of course, uh, on Boxing Day when everyone was relaxing and the wheels came off. So Boxing Day became non-existent for many of us. This was an interesting operation. Luckily, we had available air support right away. We had available salvage team right away. We had available equipment right away. We managed to get the team out to the casualty quite quickly. The tug was also mobilized. And the tug added to the operation by hooking up and, and holding the vessel in the best possible uh, direction with in view wind direction to avoid uh, the wind flaring up the flames. The temperatures measured in this fire were, were, I think, in excess of about a thousand degrees Celsius. So it, it was a massive fire, um, but it was ex extinguished quite quickly. The vessel was immobilized and we towed up to St. Helena Bay where she spent a bit of time um, undergoing repairs. But this just shows that how everything fits together in a complex salvage operation. And here as well, we had uh, very experienced firefighters who had been trained up in marine casualties joined the team um, and they were absolutely intrinsic in sorting this out as quick as possible. Critical is uh, boundary cooling. So to enable more effective firefighting is to cool the areas around. Uh, but there again, <clears throat> just looking at, at how much water you pour into the vessel and ensuring that there is adequate means of exit. But there again, it becomes a problem from a pollution perspective. If you pour in lots of water, it will become polluted and looking at pumping that uh, overboard then brings its own challenges. Container vessel on fire. I think again, I'm talking about a lot that we will cover later. So that, as I said, this is really high, high level, but what has happened over the recent years or two is missed declared cargo. It's a big challenge. Um, unscrupulous shippers shipping dangerous cargo as normal cargo to avoid paying higher freight rates and unexpected explosions happening, um, which, which does become a concern. All right, so another one of a container vessel on fire. A very um, interesting way of putting out fires. Uh, this is a forest fire control aircraft using, used, being used to put out fires on board a vessel. Jolly Rubino, another one uh, common to most people, uh, went to ground north of St. Lucia and started as a fire, went to ground, and uh, there was a big operation to get the oil off, get the cargo off. Capsizing and listing, uh, self-explanatory as well, could happen due to unplanned firefighting, could happen at port and in sea. I think, again, we had the spirit of Cape Town many years ago, which became the spook of Cape Town, sank, uh, capsized alongside. 
had to be rewritten, and it was quite a major operation. <coughs> Capsizing in Nautilus, Pont Noir, uh, Dredger capsized. Unfortunately, nine people lost their lives, so it's uh, you know something that needs to be very really well aware of. Thunder Horse, again, most people remember this. At the time, it was the most expensive salvage operation in history since being surpassed by the Costa Concordia, which one of our close colleagues and uh, South African uh, salvage master Nick Sloan uh, managed. Uh, very proud of him from a South African perspective. And now the Golden Ray in the, in the US, which is uh, probably going to surpass that as well. This is a punch through when the um, ground or, or seabed surveys aren't effectively carried out with a jack up, and this jack up punch through and capsize. Sinking cargo shifts, uh, structural failure, uh, again, fast response is required. The Phoenix, this was a control sinking. Once we had refloated her, there was no way for her to go. We couldn't tow her for scrap. Uh, the owners had walked away, insurers had walked away. So SAMHSA again, being pragmatic, agreed uh, with DFFE that she would be sunk uh, in 2,000 meters of water. And bottom left, you can see, or bottom, or upper right, bottom left, you can see the salvage team, which uh, did the dirty deed and departed her just before uh, she sank. The prestige, uh, this broke up off Spain, uh, a lot of issues about this huge pollution. There was call for a, a place of refuge. The feeling was that if she'd been brought into a, a sheltered bay and boomed off, the pollution could have been controlled. But the government at the time weren't prepared to allow her into port and uh, were faced with a much bigger pollution concern. The Mighty Servant, uh, we did this out of South Africa, a heavy lift vessel with a rig on board that sank whilst refloating the rig in Angola. With our colleagues in Smith, we were instrumental in refloating this, and she was towed to Cape Town for refurbishment. Structural failure, we have a look at here the Cape Africa again many years ago, uh, where you have structural failure, and, and this is critical in, in iron ore carriers. This is the Napoli, um, broke her back. Cape Africa, we all remember her. Uh, we were given a call saying, I've got a small crack in my hull, I need some escorting. Once you've got a diver, diver down, this is what the small crack in the hull portrayed. It was a, a massive hull, which had to be strengthened up. And uh, we did a, a transfer operation, and she was also towed for repairs. The more comfort, a uh, case of a vessel, structural failure, breaking her back. Wreck removal, um, when is a vessel a wreck, capsized, sunk? broken up, uh, total loss abandoned. The, generally, this is handed back to the p &I Club once it becomes declared a total loss. The owners then are out of the game and the local authorities will drive what is happening and will drive what their requirements are. This is then dealt directly with the p &I Clubs. Type of services, bunker removal, cargo removal, cutting. Uh, these are some pictures of the tricolor, which was cut with a Specialized cutting wire, you can see the, the clean cuts through there and then lift it out by means of uh, shear legs. Bunker, hot tapping, uh, allowing access to the bunker tanks without any possible ingress of, of water. We did this on the treasure operation. A lot of you will remember this, the uh, dreaded barges in Jakob's Bay. There again, <clears throat> we did a a lot of cutting, but as you will see later, the uh, solution to this was was explosion, um, and we'll just chat about that very briefly just now. We spoke about chain cutting and then lifting the uh, pieces up onto a barge for disposal ashore. This is just a, a, a quick picture of the cutting wire, which has ferules uh, covered in, in fact, diamonds uh, to in, enable a, a cleaner cut. The right hand picture shows a vehicle which was cut through by the chain cutter just shows the clean cuts which are achieved. The tricolor again, as you can see, again, showing the very clean cuts which go through when using a, a chain or wire cutting. 
Rec removal explosive, Napoli, I think maybe a bit later we'll talk about the SOSREP in the UK, but the SOSREP made the decision to ground this vessel. Uh, she was explosive were used to separate the front section, which was then towed offshore, allowing more time to sort out the, the rear section, which had been, uh, been put aground. Jolly Rubino, again, pragmatism of SAMHSA, knowing that if a full wreck removal was ordered, um, it would have been quite destructive to the local environment. It was in a pretty inaccessible area, so they agreed that the vessel should be blown just to make sure that there was a free flow of water through her just to ensure that all the pollutants were out. Uh, she's still up there. With, they've allowed the sea to do her work. I think she's getting less and less. Uh, interesting story, we brought in an American ex expert to do this and his nickname was Gary Boom Boom. So you can see a, a, an example of his excellent work. We spoke about the barges on Jakob's Bay. Again, uh, the same guy was brought in. Um, very well planned explosives in that the barges that were stowed on top of the barge being towed, in fact, most of them were came off and were able to be reused. Environmental care, keeping oil in the ship is the primary objective and that's also what the state has put into place on the South African coast with the ETVs to try and keep the oil on the ship, preventing vessels from going aground and getting oil into the water. And then safely removing the oil uh, is, is critical. Done by men of ship-to-ship -ship transfers. Uh, we even had to use helicopter transfers. This is a picture of, of a hot tap uh, device which is used to get into the hull allowing uh, or not allowing any form of, of release into the water and, and making a hole which pumping can be carried out through. The Kiani Satu, which ran aground just south of Neisner um, a number of years ago, there was no ways of getting a lightning vessel into her. Um, so it was quite critical that the oil was removed and at the start of the operation, before we were actually able to refloat her, uh, oil removal was done by helicopter. Very painstaking, but every load which was flown ashore was a load less which went into the water, which, uh, which is important. Jolly Rubina again, hazardous cargo. She had some tremendous hazardous cargo top right picture. You can see guys in their pr protective suits, which is how we had to work um, with, this, with this vessel. And just to close off, uh, the secrets to successful salvage, early involvement, uh, information and communication. I said earlier on, uh, very uh, accurate information coming in is intrinsic to, to the successful completion. Often salvers have to try and draw between the lines or right between the lines because the information coming in, especially from a vessel way offshore is sometimes very sketchy, given to you by people in a, in a panic. And sometimes you have to over-provide as opposed to under-provide. But again, with uh, all of those out there that could support us in the salvage operation, it just needs to be seen how critical getting this information is in this, such as plans, cargo storage, cargo types, um, the issue on board, etc., etc. It just helps uh, the successful salvage of the vessel. As I said earlier on, safety is a, is a prime driver. Um, safety drives everything and full risk assessments and risk mitigations are done before going into a salvage operation. And I think everyone must understand that at times if safety precludes progress, uh, it needs to be accepted that uh, human life is, is above all else. And that's all I have to say. Um, there will be quite a bit more on this uh, in in next week's webinar, we'll cover some local case studies this afternoon where we'll unpack this a bit more. But yeah, thank you very much for, for listening and uh, we'll see you a bit later. Thanks so much, Dave. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce my colleague Musa Mbakaza to you today. Musa completed schooling at Law Hill Maritime Centre in Simonstown and went on to complete maritime studies at CPUT. He served as a deck officer in the Mersk SAF Marine Fleet until 2018 in the capacity of chief officer from 2014. He achieved his class one master unlimited certificate of competency the year thereafter 
and joined AMSOL's fuel logistics and transportation team in Durban in 2018 in the capacity of fleet operations manager. He's recently relocated to Cape Town where he fulfills the fleet operations management function for our offshore marine services team based in Cape Town. Um, and he's responsible for amongst other vessels, the emergency towing vessel SA Amandla. And today Musa will be talking to us about parties involved in a marine emergency. And Musa, before I hand over to you, I remember the first salvage job I was ever part of at the beginning of my career in the industry was in the year 2000, and it's involved the treasure um, and obviously all the impact of, of the extensive oil spill thereafter. But I sat in the morning meetings every day uh, with the Joint Operations Committee, and what I was always struck by was the fact that the attendance register was two full pages long with at least 40 to 50 people in the room and sometimes more. Um, so I'm, on that note, I'm going to hand over to you. I think you also have a, an interesting memory of your first, the first salvage job that you observed. Uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit about that before you jump into your presentation. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Claire, for that. I'm sure it was quite an interesting experience. Um, Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so my topic for the day will be parties involved in a main emergency. But before I go into my topic, I would like to digress a bit and uh, share a bit of my own personal experience in terms of how I got exposed to salvage operations. Like a young boy growing up in the free state, um, the only salvage or only ship I was ever aware of at that age was the Titanic, uh, as you can all imagine. Um, but we all know how that ended. Fast forward a few years later, and I was studying in Simonstown, and we had the Cape Africa come into False Bay um, with structural damage, and she was anchored just uh, off the host, uh, in, in, in the False Bay area. So for me, it was quite a, a good glimpse because we had a lecturer called Mr. Inpeng who kept us uh, quite up to date in terms of what the salvage operations uh, were progressing. And uh, in terms, we really kept um, up to date in terms of what was happening. And we even got an opportunity to go on a boat on a launch and see the coffer dam and the repairs being carried out for that vessel. So it was quite an interesting uh, experience for me at an early age. And it really showed the risks involved and the intricacies involved doing an operation such as a salvage operation. Fast forward a few years later, uh, when I was a junior officer, uh, sailing my fairly inexperienced sailing in the South China Sea, in a sea of fishing boats and in heavy traffic. Um, I would, the experience I would best describe is, as one captain had said, life at sea is um, a lifetime of boredom and moments of sheer terror. Now, you can imagine being in the South China Sea and navigate you through those fishing boats and you're fairly inexperienced. There are moments when those moments of sheer terror do come by and you feel like you might end up in a situation where you actually require salvage or where the fishing boats might actually need salvaging with you on the bridge alone. But um, fair to say that is, uh, it didn't end in that and it's all a good for, uh, story to tell. So moving on to my topic, I'll be covering uh, parties involved in an emergency. I'll just be giving a brief overview of who are all the players and what they entail uh, from just a high level overview of it. If I have to put it in layman's term, if one has to imagine a vessel um, in terms of how the cost of the actual vessel in terms of the asset and the cargo, and you think of it beaching on the beach in Camps Bay, there are a lot of uh, interested parties that are involved in that kind of operation. To mention but a few, you would have the master and crew of the actual vessel. You have the ship owner, manager, and agents of the vessel, quite integral to the operation of that vessel. You have the insurance underwriters in their various uh, departments and also the protection and indemnity, admiralty lawyers, brokers, uh, salvos and subcontractors, surveyors, to name but a few. 
You then move on and you have the IMORG incident management organization, which I'll go into detail later on. You have the local authorities, um, including DOT, SAMHSA, um, TNPA, and also international organizations such as ITOPF, IOPC, and the environmental and wildlife groups, all having a vested interest in the safe salvage or minimizing the damage to the environment of a salvage vessel. To start off, um, the master, uh, as uh, described in law, is the legal representative and agent of the employer. And as such, he is empowered to sign or going to uh, assign an LOF, which is a salvage contract or agreement with the salver, should it be required when he notices that his vessel is in imminent danger and he needs to make sure or that he takes the necessary measures to, to save the ship and, the, and his vessel. So the shipmaster binds the cargo owners, time charters by signing the LOF. Um, more will be covered on the LOF in the next session of our webinar. The ship owner, a few examples of them, you've got MERSC or OCL, um, will request salvage operation, uh, salvage assistance depending time permitting and if the master has not already signed an LOF. Um, he will contact his PNI club, where he will uh, require advice and assistance uh, from the, his various insurance, uh, and then he may even award um, the salvage uh, contract to the uh, successful salvo. But then he needs to apply the principles of insurance, which ensure that he acts prudently as though his cargo is uninsured. Moving on, you've got the ship manager, sometimes referred to as the technical manager of the vessel. They normally manage the vessel on behalf of the ship owner if the ship owner tends to stay in the background. Um, and they will advise the ship owner of, of how to proceed. There have been major cases where the ship managers have uh, explicitly uh, taken over the, the salvage operation, operations, as with the examples of the Prestige and the Sea Empress. The ship owners may choose to stay in the background in such situations. The ship's agent um, is one of an entity that is uh, very, very um, hardworking in any port. So when a ship comes into port, they're normally your first point of contact and they normally get calls 24 hours nonstop um, while the vessel is alongside and if there are any difficulties. So you can imagine if there is a salvage operation with all the parties involved, how much more work the, they get to do. A very unsung hero in my books, uh, but one that really deserves the accolades um, and a mention in this presentation. So they normally represent the owners, despondent owners or char charters of a vessel. Um, their expertise lies in the local knowledge of the port. Um, as ships to go to foreign ports, so you rely on the agent's contacts with the port officials. They, this leads to them expediting, uh, you know, approvals where necessary, um, especially if a ship requires a, a port of refuge. Um, and then their relationship with the port and uh, marine authorities actually expedite the process uh, where the vessel needs uh, to, to come in. They also ensure that they manage the, the repatriation of the crew in a very speedy manner after a traumatic experience as a, a salvage operation. And they always ensure that they have their principal's interest uh, at heart throughout their uh, uh, operations or their dealings. And they ensure that they keep the media or pre uh, prevent any unauthorized media comments within that region. You've got specialist brokers, you know, these are where the ship owner will turn to, um, to, to, to get salvage vessels if the vessel is stricken or in, in danger. And then they will also, they, these brokers will advise of any other resources within the region, you know, um, you don't just get them off the yellow pages as one would say, but you really need um, to, to get hold of specialists within that industry. To, to get you the proper resources and a timely response to, to for action. Highland machinery underwriters, these are your um, marine insurances and they are spread over many um, underwriters. 
The salvo normally is concerned more with the market value of the vessel and cargo relating to the salvage value and not actually the insured value. And this will be concluded in arbitration once an LOF is signed and the salvage operation is completed. Cargo interest, um, a salvo maintains close contact with uh, cargo interest. Um, he has a duty to inform the, ca the cargo interest if an LOF is signed. Um, cargo owners and underwriters put up security for their cargo. It may lead also to gener general average being declared depending on the situation. For instance, if the salvo has to jettison uh, one cargo interest um, cargo to save or be a better benefit the salvage operation, then that could lead to, to a claim like that. P&I clubs, these are protection and indemnity insurance. Um, they were originally made up of ship owners, um, ship operators and demise charterers back in the, uh, when, when ship trading started. Um, how I normally describe ship owners is um, in layman's terms, it's ship owners that have grouped together and uh, have put money in a kitty so that if proportional to the amount of ships they own, um, almost like a modern day stock fell, but in a more advanced manner, if you, if, if you get what I'm trying to say. So they traditionally um, fund third party risks, uh, which include damage to cargo, um, carriage, war risks, and uh, the risk of environmental damage, such as oil spills and pollution, which can be quite substantial. The surveyors, these can, there's a number of these representing the ship owners, cargo owner, time charters, and PNI clubs. Um, they will advise and assist um, within the salvage operation. The South African Incident Management Organization, IMO Org, as uh, for a better word, plays a critical role in coordinating preparedness and response utilizing international recognized incident management systems, which was introduced in 2015. By adopting international best practice in incident management, the South African Department of Transport is proactively prepared to manage marine pollution incidents effectively, ensuring that the appropriate resources stakeholders are mobilized quickly and important and timeless decisions made. SAMTA plays a key role in this forum. South African Maritime Safety Authority, SAMHSA, is, is the legally designated party with overall responsibility in terms of the Marine Pollution uh, Control and Civil Liability Act. They're responsible for prevention of oil spills, contingency plans for control of shipping casualties, and they administer the act in charge of legal and financial aspects. Some Coast Guard agencies include SAMHSA and have very wide intervention. How SAMHSA implements and enforces this is um, the, it would be in one manner doing um, port state control through it, to foreign vessels that call into ports where they check that the vessels are com in compliance with international conventions, are seaworthy and do not pose an Im immediate risk to our coastline. And this then discourages uh, scrupulous uh, ship owners from actually entering our waters when they know that they are being highly enforced. National and local authorities. DOT and SAMHSA have the power to exercise ultimate control of a salvage operation, and they are the single point of control within a salvage operation. The Department of Fishing, Forestry, and the Environmental is responsible for combating and the abatement of oil spills and establishing contingency plans for coastal cleanup by local authorities. Transnational Port Authority controls South Africa's eight harbors and port limits. Should access be requested for entry to an anchorage or harbor to facilitate the salvage operation. The picture changes if the salvage operation is within port limits. As my colleague David alluded to, um, ports of refuge are uh, a bit of a pickle but then we rely on the powers that be to facilitate and assist with this regard. Other organizations, you've got ITOPF, these and uh, the International Oil Pollution Compensation Fund. These were 
formed after the sinking of the Tory Canyon, and they were mainly formed to promote the effective response to marine spills on behalf of ship owners. We've also got the Oil Companies International Forum, which is, made, is a voluntary forum made up of uh, ship owners interested in the movement of cargo, um, all cargo of any form, intertango and intercargo, ports organizations and legal organizations to mention but a few. And these are some of the uh, symbols that they are easily recognizable with. Environment, environmental and wildlife protection organizations have considerable knowledge, resources, and influence on governments and local authorities, and are a critical role player in both preparedness and response. One would almost say they are the watchdog that ensures that everyone is in check um, and that uh, all operations do not harm the environment. The media in a salvage operation, as one could expect, um, is very intense. Uh, traditional and social media pressure during an incident, um, especially with the advent of technology. An incident happens now and it's within the media in, in minutes as compared to a couple of years ago. So as an operator or salvo, one has to actively manage the press contact for social media exposure together with relevant authorities. So salvos will not discuss casualties with media without owner's consent or authority consent, but one has to actively manage this relationship. So this means you would have to give them uh, updates, or if not, then I just only need to remind you of the Tembisa 10, where stories can be uh, published, but then you know the, tr the true version of the story. So it's, it's quite, works well if you do work with the media and you use them as your partner instead of seeing them as a hindrance. Lawyers, admiralty lawyers are instructed by ship owners, um, various cargo owners, salvos or underwriters, basically everyone with an interest on the vessel in the cargo for that will later lead to arbitration. Lawyers are then appointed in the first instance as P&I correspondents, um, and then cases of arbitration and appeal for LOF are heard in London by an arbitrator from a panel of appointed by Lloyds. Salvers, as quoted, are persons whose principal business is that of rendering assistance to disabled vessels, whether they are vessels ashore or afloat, are in the fullest sense of the word professional salvers Mr. by Mr. Justin Langton from the Rosa Rosenberg, 1934. And in no particular order of importance, but I will just mention a few salvers. And first would be AMSOL and International Salvage Union and Smith Salvage, just to mention a few. As said, as one would describe, um, the parties involved as the picture depicts, it's almost like an organized mess. And uh, if you can follow the lines, it does become very confusing and it does become quite an intricate uh, web that, that one needs to keep in contact with or keep adverse of. But it is one that has worked and one that needs to be um, complied with for a su successful salvage. So the communication process, if I may just conclude or summarize, is that a marine emergency is unpredictable, can take place anywhere at any time with any number of variables at play and requiring any number of experts in multiple disciplines. If one has to just, if one has to just refer to uh, my colleague's pre earlier presentation, salvage operations normally occur in ungodly hours when the weather is at its most worst condition and then that's when the experts uh, are called out to assist the ship in distress. Knowing who to talk to about what, when, and where, and why is critical. Defining this communication chain for your organization is an important part of an emergency response planning. And that will lead to the timely activation of uh, a salvage operator to assist you, which then uh, greatly affects the success of that salvage.
Making it work means listening, prioritizing, and building a strong network amongst role players, especially before a marine emergency occurs. I thank you all for your time. Thank you so much, Musa. Uh, I'm going to ask Dave to switch on his camera again um, and take us towards the end of the webinar by dealing with the National Pollution Prevention Service itself, as well as recent case studies. Thanks, Claire. <clears throat> so I think also, um, you know, just going back to what, what Musa said, um, there are so many parties involved in the salvage operation. And generally, or not generally, but often, uh, the person controlling that operation from the office is in the direct line of fire because that person will obviously be feeding back to SAMHSA on, on the first basis as to what's happening. But uh, when Musa unpacked the amount of people involved, they all want to know what's happening. Um, so it becomes quite chaotic um, and it really needs I think quite a calm mind to be able to deal with it and to get information out. But that's where the support services within the office, uh, like Claire's department and Graham's department on the fleet side, will always come in and support uh, and assist. What has also happened is uh, this dreaded ARS, uh, marine traffic, has become quite a hot potato when it comes to us. Generally, when uh, when the tug goes in the past, uh, no one really knew, it was all quiet, and uh, you did the job often before anyone actually knew it was happening, unless there were press releases issued. What happens now is it seems everyone's watching marine traffic. Sometimes I think that, I don't know if it's possible, but the, there's an alarm put on marine traffic when the tug leaves the berth, and as soon as that happens, uh, the amount of queries coming in at that stage as to where the tug's going to, what's happening, uh, becomes a little bit more uh, more challenging. And uh, when you tell the client that the tug's actually making 22 knots towards the towards his casualty, and he says, well, marine traffic says 10 knots, sometimes it's a bit difficult to explain. But just quickly unpacking the uh, ETV structure on the South African coast, uh, the overview of it, that's been driven by NDRT since the mid 70s, um, preventing accidents at sea, prevent impact on life, environment and property. So the driver of, of, of the structure in those days was to keep the oil in the vessel, which meant the, uh, the building of, of two big, powerful, fast tugs. And uh, as you know, it was then the, uh, well, in fact, the first country in the world to, to put a state sponsored ETV um, on station to ensure that the coastline is protected and as everyone knows now most of the first world and other countries in the world have followed our lead so i think it's something south africa needs to be quite proud of and i think as well the commitment to the government by the government to this also needs to be lauded in that the services has continued we all know it's high priority and uh, from our side and i suppose from many ship owners side and insurers side i think the role of the government in supporting this is, is much welcomed and much appreciated. As we said, uh, the tug is owned in South Africa, registered in South Africa. In fact, she was built in South Africa in Durban uh, in, in the mid, mid late 70s. So very much a South African born and bred uh, institution, so well known. And I think if you look at the WhatsApp and uh, Facebook chat groups, and she's well featured. And she's a beautiful machine. She really, the lines are great. Um, but she does rock and roll. We will talk about that a bit later. So the tug is on standby 24-7, 365. Her bollard full is 185 tons. In terms of our contract with DOT, we have a KPI to be able to depart in 30 minutes, uh, which is quite important then that she's at a berth where you can have a short power connection, keeping the engines warm through without having to start uh, start cold engines when you get a call out and able to respond generally she's based in cape town but she can be shifted around according to the samsa stroke ndrt requirements she has a 50-day range can tow the largest vessels afloat i think all remember in the days when the Vorad was with us normally one tug operated in the offshore or international towing market um, and the other tug was kept on the coast here 
And then the range of 50 days was quite important uh, when you were turning big oil rigs and such like. Typical uh, call out safety of life, search and rescue. I keep on saying that that's the priority. And uh, over and above everything else, when the tug can assist in this, that is the main priority. Um, if that's not such a driver with regard to incidents on the coast, um, emergency towage, I think most people are aware, which is why I'm a bit tired today, but we've had a, an all night session with a, <clears throat> a vessel uh, in the Cape Gallus area, which the tug is now successfully towing offshore. So there again, it could have been a, a major catastrophe and this is what the tug is here for. I think we should, should at some stage uncalculate how many thousand tons of oil um, this tug has prevented from ending up on South African beaches and basically the, the saving to the South African government. This is, in fact, was a video that we received from the tug and unfortunately we cannot show the video here, but this shows pretty much uh, the weather conditions that she's faced with. Unfortunately, the video gives it a lot more impact, um, but yeah, sometimes when she's out there, it, it gets a bit, gets a bit mucky, if that's how we can call it. South Africa's pretty much confluence uh, between the east and the west, and everything comes together around Cape Agulhas, a very high intensity traffic area, and monitored by MRCC, uh, which is a, a SAMHSA-driven initiative. Um, but yeah, a lot happening at any one given time and a lot to keep the eye on. TNPA also very, very supportive in this, especially once you do get a casualty and you need to bring her into port. This is quite a challenge and we work very, very closely with TNPA to ensure that port entry is effective and safe. And DOT, which obviously drives the, uh, from a helicopter view perspective and, and SAMHSA report into DOT. We work, as I said in the last presentation, extremely closely with MRCC. Um, sometimes they know things before we do and will alert us very frequently. As with the present uh, casualty on the coast, we pick it up via international contacts that we have very, very close ties to, who will, such as the brokers that, that Musa mentioned, but also the agents that we have relationships with will immediately get hold of us if there's an issue especially those first world or first class ship owning companies that take the safety of their ship seriously as opposed to many other companies that just wait to see how things pan out and then hit the panic button when the vessel is one mile off the beach. The role of, of an ETV, uh, this is the Wakashio, which everyone recalls um, caused devastation in Mauritius and I think Mauritius' biggest uh, income driver is tourism. So this was of major impact to, to Mauritius. And here I think we can honestly say that if Mauritius had an ETV, this would have been prevented. I said earlier on the first 24 hours on the grounding are crucial. It took a while for her to, to start breaking and we honestly believe that if there had been an ETV on site within a day, uh, she may very well have been able to be refloated and this pollution catastrophe would have been averted. We had a very similar instance on the South African coast at the same time, um, which we'll cover just now, uh, the Yuan Hua Hu, uh, which was a very similar situation, but there <clears throat> having what AMSOL has, uh, support tugs in, in, in Durban, uh, which are on charter to SAPREF, but SAPREF generally will allow us release getting that support tug down the coast uh, to hold on to the casualty whilst the ETV moves away up the coast, but we'll cover that just now. But I think this just shows the importance of, of, a, um, of an ETV, and I'm well aware that the Mauritian government are considering this quite seriously at the moment. This is just a depiction of what has really happened on the South African coast over the last two years. As you can see, there's a lot of really high profile um, instances, any one of which could have resulted in, in a grounding, uh, pollution and impact on the local economy. So here again, the value of the ETV is, is really well depicted and what she does on the South African coast to ensure that 
the coast is protected as, as effectively as possible. We will have a look at some of these in, in a little bit of depth uh, as we go along. So these happened in 2020. Um, the Pippet Arrow was a standby in, in Table Bay. Uh, Coast Star was a rescue towage. Zindang Yang was an escort. Anakatu was a rescue towage. C. Max Stanford rescue towage. And the Gene was a standby. Just to have a look at these a little bit more detail, uh, SAMHSA will, will approve the tug to assist with safety standbys, allowing vessels to immobilize as long as she doesn't have any other commitments or concerns. I think, again, this is a very good initiative because it does take away risk in that vessels on the coast who have equipment issues or technical issues have the ability to repair them under controlled condition and able to resume their voyages. So it's an added protection to the coast that this service is, is permitted. The Coast Star, this was a Japanese fishing vessel which broke down, I think, about 1,500 miles south of South Africa. And if you look at the MRCC area of authority, I think South Africa's got one of the biggest MRCC coverage areas in the world. In fact, it goes right down to Antarctica. So in this particular instance, MRCC were quite involved. This vessel was immobilized in the Southern Ocean in horrendous conditions. From a safety of life perspective, um, SAMHSA allowed us to proceed to assist this vessel. It was on the basis that there was another uh, substitute tug on the coast, which we've managed to put into place. And we'll see just now how we utilize that substitute tug. The Anakato, um, our favorite vessel, ran out of fuel, had propulsion issues right in the middle of the traffic lanes approaching Durban. And uh, eventually we managed to get her into tow and, and deliver it to Durban. The CMAX Stanford towage and standby, this was a vessel similar to what we've dealt with overnight and uh, the uni space, which we'll cover later, which could very well have resulted in the grounding without the input of the tug. The Gene was another standby job, allowing uh, effective repairs to be made to her engines and her voyage to continue safely. Other instances, we spoke about the Caribobo earlier on and how Response services need to seamlessly uh, fit together, such as the tug, the salvage team, uh, equipment, et cetera, et cetera, and involving effective input from the owners, PNI clubs, et cetera. This one worked very well. It could have been a major catastrophe. She was not far off Cape Town on Boxing Day, and we managed to resolve this, this issue. So the Yuan Hua Hu, um, the South African coast is, is an interesting coastline. I mean, even though you've got the, uh, the current, the main current, Mozambique into the Gullis, which comes sort of north to south, and you have the counter current up the coast. I'm not sure why, but almost every instance when a vessel breaks down, she heads towards the coast with amazing speed and, and alacrity. So it's something we need to be prepared for in that when you see a vessel broken down and drifting, you need to be aware, and I think in our relations and, and dealings with SAMHSA, they're well aware of this as well, that at some stage uh, she's going to head directly on shore. And you can see with this one, I mean, she was quite happily tracking parallel to the coast and all of a sudden took a sheer directly onto the shore. And at one stage, uh, SAMHSA put the Joint Operations Committee together. It was in the height of the COVID lockdown, and we were able to do this virtually, which, which worked quite well. A little bit different to been able to have those discussions across the table, but it was chaired by Captain Keller, who's the DECO of SAMHSA. Quite effectively, he involved all the relevant parties, including DFFE, the SOLVORS, local authorities, etc. And in my opinion, it worked very well. What we immediately did when this became a concern, the top right hand picture is the Sianda, which is a tug as a civilian. We have contract to uh, SAPREF in Durban. SAPREF are aware of the challenges on the coastline, and if they're able to, as with most of our other clients, they will release uh, from an emergency of property, emergency of life perspective. She came down the coast, uh, bottom left hand picture, she managed to hook up the Generally, the photographs of an operation like bottom, uh, the left-hand picture shows very benign, calm, 
very happy conditions, but I don't know why. Whenever you take photographs, this is what it looks like. In this instance, it was like that, but leading up to this, uh, it was pretty lumpy. It was in the middle of winter. This operation was effectively resolved. We had a substitute tug on the coast, which was based in Cape Town. She mobilized up the coast. In fact, it was a, a big anchor handler. So while she was mobilizing, this Yanda got there within 12 hours, put a line up and held her whilst we wait, waited for the other tug to arrive. This is the conclusion of the operation. It was, I think, if not the biggest ship to enter Durban at that time, it was the widest vessel, if I'm not mistaken. But there again, a very coordinated and well-planned operation with the port authorities, with SAMHSA, ensuring that the tug master's requirements were met, uh, assist tugs on location where required. They asked for this yonder to be connected to the stern as a steering tug, and you can see her on the right-hand side of the picture. The Swire boat that we had on charter actually towed her into Durban. And this operation ended effectively and well, uh, with the vessel being put alongside, repaired, and she's busy trading again. But it could have ended up a lot worse. It could have very much ended up like a Mauritius operation. Even though she was light, as can be seen by the pictures, sometimes these vessels can carry up to 4,000, 5,000 cubes of fuel. And this can make a tremendous mess, if you remember, Many, many years ago, four or 5,000 tons was often the dead weight of tankers carrying fuel up and down the coast. The Atlantic Emperor, this was another one of our favorite scrap vessels. She was the, I think maybe we'll recall the Hispania Gracia, which sat in Cape Town for many, well, many years, two or three years, uh, before she was towed to scrap by a vessel which had come down from the Middle East. As normally happens, the tow was parted. Um, it became quite a challenging operation. The tug was sent out immediately. Uh, unfortunately, when the towage approvals were set up, there, were, <clears throat> there was access to the vessel with pilot ladders, but because of the horrendous weather conditions, those were not, no longer in use and we could not transfer personnel from the tug to the casualty. So we brought in our good colleagues at AGA Helicopters, who we have a frame agreement with, and are able to put them on notice almost immediately for response to casualties like this. And the bottom picture shows the helicopter transporting the towage team or the salvage team to the vessel. A connection was made over the stern because the tug that was towing a part of the tow, the wire was hanging off the bow, and uh, was, we were unable to hook up in, in what was a little bit of a mess on the bow. So we hooked up on the stern, expecting the initial towing tug to come and make fast. But then it became a big issue because weather conditions precluded them from making fast. For some reason, they were concerned about their wire because to make fast, we would have had to jettison the wire, but they then got quite soon concerned because the wire was their property. Uh, it became a legal issue. Eventually, permission was granted to dump the wire. We had to get DFFE approval uh, to dump it, which to DFFE's credit, this happened quite quickly. So the wire was dumped, and basically we kept a, tow a stern towage connection up the coast until the towing tug could replace a wire in Durban, came out and took over the tow and delivered her successfully to scrap probably about a month later. But this was quite a complex operation took a number of days, a number of parties having to work very closely together to effect a success. And again, back to Musa's earlier presentation, many of those parties were involved in this. And uh, again, communication, transparent transfer of information was critical, as it is in most salvage operations. Some more pictures of the Atlantic Emperor. This shows the connection we made to the stern. Uh, the bottom pictures are the mess to the bow. The chain uh, bridle had actually chafed right through the fairies, and this had to be built up by a team we got out of Durban before the initial towing tug made the connection again. <clears throat> the Vishwaramant, this was a vessel which lost her rudder pretty much on the South African Mozambican border and came down uncontrolled in the current. 
the tug responded and we were able to put up a connection and bring her down to Durban. Obviously, a vessel with no rudder becomes a real problem child to, to tow and bringing her into port was a hell of a challenge. But there again, close cooperation between ourselves, TNPA, ensuring that our tug master is happy with the precautionary measures and pre preparedness measures which are put into place and she was delivered safely alongside. The uni space, uh, this was one we did on June the 30th in horrendous conditions in Cape Town. We had to mobilize the tug quite late at night. She had lost her rudder as well, was drifting towards Hans Bay, uh, could very possibly have grounded, managed to get her anchor down, but in those weather conditions, not sure how long the anchor would have lasted. Uh, we mobilized the tug probably in some of the worst conditions that I personally have been involved with and um, off she went out to sea. This was uh, one of our newly promoted masters, uh, Simon Radebe, did this job, and it was his first sort of coal face job, uh, but we would ensured that there was sufficient skill transfer using some of our older masters who are very, very experienced and well adept at doing these sort of operations. So this was his first job, <clears throat> a, a very, very nice guy, interesting character, uh, able to to be um, light, humid in, in very stressful conditions, which I think helps everybody else around. Uh, after he left, I gave him a call just outside the breakwaters and he was battling to speak because he was being thrown all over the place. As I said earlier on, the tugs have a, the tug has a beautiful um, shape and sea line, which adds to speed, but yeah, they bounce around <clears throat> quite dramatically at sea, or she does. And he said to me, it's, it was like riding an untrained horse, which uh, raised a chuckle. He also said to me that it's the first time he'd taken her out of port. And it's amazing that taking her out of port on your own, all of a sudden, how small the harbour exit seems. And it's funny that as you got closer and closer, the harbour, harbour exit seemed to get narrower and narrower. So these are the sort of uh, comments which help everybody on the salvage operation when it can lift your spirits and make you think that, yeah, there's, uh, there's other things to life other than the stress that you're experiencing at the time. This is some pictures of the uni space. The anchors did hold. We got to her the next morning. Uh, there's no certainty as the if the anchors would continue of holding because of the weather condition, but we were able to make a connection and deliver her to Cape Town. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of today's session, and I trust the session did impact positively into your knowledge base. Very interesting information shared by Dave on how salvage jobs that frequently occur at sea could be impactful to our env environment. We have seen a couple of salvage jobs with vessels like the Prestige and um, Guest Roman and Springbok and others um, and, and what Musa also shared with us in terms of the parties involved when it comes to claims and other requirements. Keep well, everyone, and stay safe. Thank you so much.